Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Well, welcome back, everybody. It is good uh, to have you joining us today. We have got a really important topic to dis- uh, discuss, and I actually hope a lot of this stuff feels important to people, Scott. But um, what are we talking about today, man? We're going to talk about the Equality Act, which doesn't sound very equal as I'm reading about it. Right. Uh, this has gotten a lot of press recently, and today we want to um, probably do a few things. For those of you who have maybe heard of it but don't know much about it, we'll try to define it a little bit. We'll give some key characteristics of it, try to lay out some just factual things in terms of what it says and what it's going to do if it gets um, passed, and then also have some commentary as pastors in terms of wanting just to help our people, but anyone that this might reach um, who would name the name of Christ, understand why this is is um, an exceedingly dangerous reality and just what we might need to be ready for. And so um, I'll I'll launch this in here. What is the Equality Act? Um, The Equality Act uh, would amend the 1964 Civil Rights Act to explicitly prevent discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And so uh, it is, it's actually been around for a little while. This uh, passed in late February in the House, and it's up in the Senate right now, but it passed, I want to say in 2019, it passed in the House and was more or less dismissed in the Senate, being controlled by the Republicans, and folks knew that it would be. It, it, to a degree, seemed like a bit of a stunt uh, at that time because it had no, no opportunity in, in reality, but now it does. And so a couple things about this. Um, this would explicitly include—the Civil Rights Act would, if this were passed, explicitly include categories, which it was never meant to include, but categories driven by LGBTQ and such uh, activist communities in the Civil Rights Act. It's gonna it's gonna essentially equate um, the Civil Rights Act with with race uh, to all things um, LGBTQ and more. Now, uh, which gonna, is not new again, right? Agreed. Yeah, right, it's right, that's right. not new yeah. in terms of. Um, this movement to equate the civil rights movement in general with the sexual revolution movement has been around. Has been around for a long time. Decades. Trying to equate some what I think the Bible would make very clear are um, you know sexual perversions with the level of melanin in your skin and saying those are the it's the same thing. We right. need to battle for equal rights to engage in those things as much as we fight for equal rights for those of more melanin in their skin. Right, right. So in order to pass, you need sixty votes to pass uh, this equality a, Act. an amendment such as that in the Senate. You gotta get sixty out of a hundred and the, the Democrats have fifty, the Republicans have fifty, uh, and it is very, very unlikely that they will be able to reach sixty, uh, because that's called the, the filibuster rule. It's kind of a super majority that has to uh, pass, and so it's not a simple majority in this case. However, this is part of the hot-button issue here, is the Democrats using what could be called a nuclear option, because they have the presidency, the House, and the Senate, uh, they could feasibly um, blow up the filibuster. They could remove the filibuster and actually go to a simple 51-49 majority, or or 5150 because the vice president would be the tie breaking vote. So right. if it was 5050, uh, they know what Kamala Harris would vote for and they would be able to pull this off. But this is again where the tension rises because the, if the Democrats do this sort of thing, they blow up the filibuster, remove it, and only need a simple majority. That's not only for this. Um, act that they're trying to pass. That's going to be f- forever, feasibly. And so um, when, let's just say when, uh, Republicans get a 51 or a 52 to 48 majority, they will be able to uh, use against the Democrats the very same thing that they themselves were victims of in 2021, having essentially no uh, opportunity to, to block uh, anything, and there's no more supermajority for any act. And so could this be undone, or could other things get going? And feasibly within two years, you flip a couple of seats, and what the Democrats did in blowing up the filibuster will come back to bite them. And that yeah. might be one reason why the Demo- the Republicans never did it, 
because they knew the consequences on right. the other side. Right. So it's the short-term, long-term game. This is politics. This is ugly politics. It's it's too bad it's, it's where we are. But um, that's kind of the lay of the land of just what it's seeking to do. Um, this is very broad. And then also the reality that it has never been um, as re- realistic to see it actually pass because of the control the Democrats have right now. Hmm. And yet it seems like the pressure to get this done... This would be the time, right. if, at, if ever, now. to do that. Yep. And so yep. that's yep. why the risk is very real, and it would undo quite a few things. And this is something Biden ran his uh, campaign Correct. on, that he said the whole first 100 days, this is going to be a top, top priority. We want to push this through and tried to defend it in some abominable ways, but um, that's what he got elected on. And so, well, guess what? You got to satisfy the base. You got to uh, come out with the type of aggression that um, people said he and they um, should. And so this is what they're doing. It's right in front of us. So let me go over a couple of the core essential things. And Scott, um, slow me down uh, as I go over. There's about seven core things. Obviously, you could look up and find 11 or you could find 10 or whatever. Let me just look at seven that I found really important with a few quotes from the bill itself. So uh, the bill would end federal legal recognition of complementary male and female sex in in, in favor of gender identity. So everything would ultimately simply be about the preferred gender and and literally the fluidity of, and, and if and when you change your mind about that one, Whatever you say now is what you have the authority over. So removing the biological piece altogether. Right. uh, Based on how the Lord has made you, uh, you could say in one sense, again, this is uh, not a political podcast, but it's a podcast about how do we think about these things that are going to be, these are are radical, this is a radical bill that's looking to be passed. How do we look at it from a biblical perspective? And in some sense, and I've seen this even on Twitter, there is something to saying, like um, male and female, God, he created them. That's the end of the discussion right there. Uh, That's Genesis chapter 2. And very much what this will do is essentially uh, dismantle Mm -hmm. a a key aspect of being made in the image of God. Yep. Secondly, the bill would eliminate the traditional right to privacy of women and girls in public facilities in favor instead of gender identity. So here's a quote from the bill. An individual shall not be denied access to a shared facility, including a restroom, a locker room, and a dressing room that is in accordance with the individual's gender identity. I would just hope for those of you listening that you um, would be able to tell right away that that has disaster written all over it. And in states that have already gone um, kind of the direction of the Equality Act, there is no shortage of... um, examples, not only of like, you know, uh, teenage girls are uncomfortable when, you know, a biological male forces their way into their uh, uh, locker room after PE, after practice or whatever. It's not just that, although that really ought to be where we draw the line to protect them, but it's also acts of violence sexually being done and, um, and very little recourse these young women have because it's literally, they're, they're allowed to be in there. Yeah, you were telling me about the example of what could happen in the prison system. Right. If you have a male prisoner who identifies as a woman and then asks to be transferred to the female prison, what could take place there? Um, it's it's honestly terrifying to think about the various ways that this would play out potentially. Right. And it's this is again, let's get back to scripture. So you got Genesis one and two, right? Uh, God uh, created man in His own image, in the image of God He created him, male and female He created them. Genesis one twenty seven, right? There is clear distinction of roles to the glory of God. God, part of our image bearerness, but then you have where we've come as a society is to Romans one, this right. complete giving over to the futility of our minds, right to the to the darkened understanding, being alienated from the life of God, and now we are we are being left to ourselves. If you want it so bad, part of the passive wrath of God is to give us over to these things, and this inversion is happening. We did it in worshiping the creation instead of the Creator. Right. And that has now spiraled into, we can't even identify some of these key aspects of the way God created men distinctly and women distinctly. And so this is very much uh, one of the, I would say, uh, results of that tragic giving over, that passive wrath of God that we've chose not to honor him or give thanks to him. Yeah. 
and another example would be um, homeless shelters for women, uh, uh, it oftentimes related to uh, uh, abuse and shelters that would bring in women who just would be re either restored to physical health or given uh, treatment psychologically, and yet men who simply claim, at least in theory or principle, claim to be a woman would be mandated to be allowed to sleep the night in these shelters. And so... Um, that again is just terrifying reality that these women who are vulnerable, it, it really is the least and the most vulnerable getting, um, getting harmed by this. There is nothing equal in terms of this equality act that when you look at it from a biblical worldview and simply um, a sense of truth and a sense of justice. So continuing on, uh, another example, the Equality Act would essentially eviscerate women's and girls' sports. Yeah, yeah. Now, we're it's... not saying this would happen overnight. No, no. Uh, you're not going to see a mixing up of every sports team um, You know, this next fall and spring. That's not what this is you're about. You're going to see some records change, though. But it's the <laughs> ongoing reality that even in Connecticut, a few uh, teenage girls and their families sued the state because mm -hmm. I think it was either two or three boys uh, set a total of 15 state records claiming to be women. They immediately, I want to say they were like sophomores or juniors too, yeah. uh, set 15 records related to uh, jumping and running and all, all of that just immediately. Right. Um, and I, your, your, your wife Erin was even telling me that when she was um, playing at the highest level of collegiate athletics in, in you know women's soccer, uh, she would play like the U16 boys in some club sport and, and they were already faster. Yeah. They could already outrun. And now there was ways, obviously the girls were more skilled in ways, but sure. more powerful, faster at simply 16 years old. It is. It's true. And I think it's actually U14, by the way. Okay. But, <laughs> but the point is, is that, yeah, you know, if they were kept to a small sided game where they were in a little small area, skill wise, yeah, they were more developed in their skills, but athletically these kids were so fast. Now they're, you know, national team players and at 14 years old, but still that difference, that distinction, it's, it's, it's so sad because right. I have little girls yep. that are, are learning to play just like their mom played and, and their dad played. Um, but, but it's just the thought of that being completely undone. You use the word eviscerate. It's a great word because it's a strong word. That's just, it's heartbreaking. This is a tragic, tragic thing. And it's essentially, that's what it will do. Kiss and goodbye. It will be gradual enough where maybe it won't be perceived right away. But as we are already seeing, right. um, records are changing. Um, and we're, it's basically going to become male sports times two. And in places like New Zealand, I believe, sorry if the country is wrong, but where rugby is one of the most popular sports and professional women's rugby rugby leagues exist, there are biological males just running roughshod over women, and you can actually get some, uh, not not funny as in haha, but just alarming photos of just terrified professional women rugby players going up against these 6'4", 220-pound men, biological males, who are telling the world they're women, and they're mandated to be allowed to play, and they're, mm -hmm. it's just, again, that's only an application. That doesn't make this evil in and of itself, that, oh, no, women's sports, but... Sure. The irony is that we've spent decades, have we not, fighting for women's sports. Right. Fight Title IX, fighting for equality and the number of sports and the way women's start, sports are treated. And, yeah. and yet now we're just with a stroke of relatively a pen or votes. We're going to begin to dismantle that. Mm -hmm. um, the Equality Act will be used to mandate school curricula that affirm and promote sexual orientation and gender identity views. This is already going on, but this is going to very likely become a federal mandate for public schools. Uh, and, and even to a degree, private schools, if they receive any kind of assistance from the government to have to um, have to promote these things. Uh, the Equality Act will be used to remove custody rights from parents who refuse to have minor children undergo transgender medical interventions and procedures. And again, there's a degree to which these things are already going on, that when a 12-year-old a girl comes into her um, school doctor, school nurse, and says, I, I, I am a boy or I want to be a boy, they... Um, have no obligation to tell the parents and they're allowed to start taking puberty block puberty blockers and all kinds of um, just chemically dangerous things for their young bodies as they're growing and this is um, to set the record straight here not about uh, necessarily the reality that you know what's commonly called gender dysphoria is a real thing that mm. those people need compassion and care and help mm. but what's going on is rather than help them they are being affirmed to the degree that there's literal pressure mm. if this is the way you feel today, then tomorrow, without 
help or counsel, you should begin taking hormone blockers, be, be taking, a, depending on which direction you're trying to go. It's just, uh, so we want to be sensitive to the reality that there's something real, and yet that's not what they're simply doing. They are just running over the entire culture um, with transgender, what they call equality, yeah. but is a massive inequality to... And that's even more yeah. because it's the undermining of the family as well. Right. You know, God has given parents to be authorities in the lives of their kids for good reason. And the, the kids, according to Ephesians 6, uh, ought, ought to be, you know, at Colossians 3, obedient to their parents. It's one of the Ten Commandments to honor your father and mother. Um, that's being stripped in that moment where they have full autonomy in their lives. And it's an undermining of the structures of authority God's appointed. So obviously God is the greatest authority, and he gives derived authority uh, over us and starts at the level of the government. And then there's the church and the authority therein, and they're 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 not the same kind of authority, right. but they're given by God. And then there's the family, which is being undermined here. And it's the government, another authority, leveraging a godless ideology that is using right. that right. to dismantle another authority. This is what sin does. Sin destroys, right? Sin, sin, sin unravels the very fabric of the design by which God has established um, uh, the world to work and people to walk in. And then, of course, it, it's, it's a violation of the consciences as well, which when you get to the individual is is a sense of authority that the Lord has instilled in every human being, which has been horribly horribly calloused in this time. Yeah, yeah, and, and a, a word picture of these uh, uh, spheres of authority would be concentric circles. So this isn't a hierarchy of God on top, second is the government, third is the church, Correct. fourth is the family. Correct. If anything, it's the personal governance, it's self-governance, then it's family government, then it's church and civil government after that, but concentric Concentric circles would be distinct roles and limitations where one does not trespass into the other's God-given authority and territory, but we also, I, I say concentric because there's overlap. I'm a father, I'm a Christian, I'm a citizen. Right. Um, but but let's not get into, oh, well, uh, where are the lines? They're, they're in the scriptures, and the, God limits them um, profoundly, and there's great authority given by God to the family, which is being absolutely... If undermined, it's, uh, in this. Uh, uh, in, uh, undermined, yeah. eviscerated again will be a good word. A couple more, and then we'll move on to some other ideas here. But since the Equality Act exempts itself from the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the RFRA, religious schools, hospitals, adoption agencies um, could face federal sanctions for upholding their teachings regarding life, sexuality, and marriage under the legislation. So this is just just this is abominable here the religious freedom restoration act of 1993 shall not provide a claim concerning or defense uh, for a covered title or provide a base of challenging the application or enforcement of a covered title talk about knowing that you are perverting justice and doing wickedness by preemptively putting up a a um, another act the religious freedom restoration act of 1993 preemptively canceling the ability to, um, you know, look at precedent and, and be in a court of law and use that act. It's just, it's incredible, it's blatant, and it is anything but equal. Um, lastly, this, the Equalities Act, uh, the text that names a form of discrimination against pregnancy would be used to punish healthcare workers who refuse to perform an abortion or outlaw policies that ban funding for the procedure. So this just gets that this it gets into abortion as well. It gets into not only abortion on demand, but continuing to push it and outlawing an individual doctor or a insurance, you know, agency or a um uh, an employer who has an insurance provider and they cannot go on conscience, they cannot go on religious exemption for any of that to withhold something like an abortion from a pregnant woman maybe seeking it. Wow. So uh, we're not just here to describe the Equality Act. We want to um, we want to get into some of these issues of how do we respond to the Equality Act. We've been responding as we've gone, uh, uh, not even line by line, but just kind of big topic um, by big topic. But five core ways that Christians often respond to legislation, uh, particularly policies that are ungodly and that are unbiblical. Now, of course, this is by no means the only one of the first one. There's been um, a tremendous amount, but some rise in relevance, and they rise with a certain threat 
uh, to, again, not just religious freedom. It's important. But they, they rise to the level of, of human flourishing, uh, to threaten that and to just um, undermine uh, humanity entirely. And so how do Christians respond to this? Um, take us through a, a few of these, just as we look at this, uh, ways that we often respond and, and which one ought we to respond with. Yeah, you could talk about it from a, a bunch of different angles that we've seen that displayed, but Christ, the Christ of culture, where you, you've got, uh, the culture is really the focus there. You've got pe- modifying beliefs and values to accommodate this, whatever this new cultural norm is. So essentially it's kind of sweeping it up in and including it with the Christ of our Christianity, our Christianity in general. Let's just, hey, where the culture goes, we go, we accommodate in that right. sense. That's Christ of culture. Christ against culture is Christians demonizing those who disagree and see them as the enemies, which again, my fundamental problem with that is we can't do that. If we start to demonize them as the enemy, we are ostracizing ourselves from the very ones Christ left us on the earth to reach. And so as difficult as this is to even think that this type of act is on the table, if our... um, identification of the the areas of concern are there, it cannot lead us to making them the enemies. It has to stir in us a desperate um, compassion that leads us to actually seeking to minister to these people, to bring the gospel to bear, to no longer be um, afraid of opening our mouths, but in the words of Paul in Ephesians 6, to be praying for boldness that you may open your mouth and declare the gospel as you ought to speak right. and bring the gospel to bear on some of these things. So Christ against culture, not our play. But a lot of times is the play, especially of the fundamental fundamentalist culture mm. in general. Now, we can recognize th- these are enemies of God. These are people who have made themselves... Uh, at, but as were we... Every sinner as, is, as is, is an we. enemy of so God. So not um, treating them as as not not only unregenerate, but now beyond the reach of God and treating them um, beyond what God would ever call us to do. It's what you do with that. Yeah. You know, Psalm 5 is very clear. The whole idea that we like to carry on is the... Um, you know, we think it's a Bible verse... Um, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Right. Um, but it seems very clear in places like Psalm 5 that that doesn't actually work out as well as we would want it to work out. It's what is our responsibility to the sinner. And in light of what we've been saved from and what we've been saved to, community with God's people, we are then right. sent as God's people to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And our message is not one of judgment, it's one of salvation. Right. Now is the day of salvation. And so we have to make sure that as we are horrified and just um, disappointed, and uh, it's not even a strong enough word for some of these things going on, we can't be the mentality of Christ against culture. Then there's the Christ above culture piece, which is adhering to biblical morality when with Christians, but letting it slide in their everyday life. And so what can happen is you can start to privatize your Christianity. You can start to hold it as like, this is a private conviction. I don't really talk about it that much. My spiritual life. It starts to shelve versus, it. It's yeah, these, these, yeah. this movement, this cultural movement starts to shelve your faith. Mm-hmm. And so it's not any longer kind of on the forefront of your life. You're not living loudly for Jesus. You're living very quietly for Jesus. Jesus is but a whisper in terms of your active lifestyle. You may try to claim, well, no, I'm still engaged. I'm still reading my Bible. I'm still, you know, worshiping on my own kind of quietly or privately. And I think stuff like this has the tendency to push us in that direction, sure. the Christ above culture. Then there's the Christ and culture kind of paradox where you've got some engaged in secular society to defend religious liberty. They seek to secure a minority position for evan- evangelicals within the culture. Hmm. So that moral majority kind of becoming more the moral minority and holding fast yeah. to that as much as possible. Let's get the morals um, down. Let's keep trying to push that. And I think that that's a race we're losing quickly. So what what is the answer? So, for example, in the Equality Act, I've been reading some about Republicans perhaps would be kind of pushed if they feel like they were given adequate amendments to religious liberty. 
if if the if there's a certain wording of the act that would kind of tip your hat to religious liberty, um, they might be you know well okay we we got religious freedom still you know the Equality Act passed but we maintain religious freedom because look at this clause this three sentence clause and it's just like have you not been paying attention for the last at least five to ten years especially about these clauses are essentially meaningless right. Right. So what we're kind of suggesting is sort of a version of Christ transforming culture, yeah. not Christ of culture, not Christ against culture, not Christ above culture, not the Christ and culture paradox, but rather Christ transforming culture. Now, I want to make a note here that I think was helpful is that uh, Augustine w broke down sort of two different distinct approaches to Christianity, more of a conversionist approach and more of a transformationist approach. Um, we're advocating for, I, I want to say, both. Mm, okay. uh, I, I want to start with the conversionist piece, though, and that's the non-negotiable. And then how that piece plays out is where I would say the transformationist piece plays out. Yeah. Conversionist is to say that our primary responsibility is to bring the gospel, is to be gospel witnesses and proclaimers that they who are dead in their trespasses and sins might hear about the grace of God, that but God rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us has made us alive together by faith in Christ, right? And through faith in Christ and repentance from your sin, you can be transferred out of the kingdom of darkness in, into the kingdom of his beloved son. When we talk about Christ transforming culture, I want to say that has to be the foundation piece of it. We have to have a focus on conversionism. Regeneration. Regeneration. The transformation comes through regeneration. Exactly. Not just new laws. Exactly. And not just avoiding bad laws getting started. Exactly. But through, through individuals and families that develop a cultural movement to be transformed through the gospel. Right. And that comes with faithful comes with faithful preaching that comes week in and week out, gathering with the saints to proclaim, to sing, to live in a manner that would demonstrate you are light, the light shining in the darkness. Now, Jesus is the light of the world, but we're called shining lights. Sure. Uh, and Philippians 2 talks about that very thing, that we're to hold fast to the word of life, and, and we're to be shining lights in this twisted and first generation. And Paul's writing in the first century, and that was true then in a certain manner, and we're just seeing another manner of twisted and perverse generation, to shine the light of the truth of God's Word, and right. so uh, thus transforming culture. And that takes a long time. That takes that patient endurance, that what is the individual Christian's you know, next most faithful move. Right. It's personal obedience to the Lord, it's gathering, committing in the church, and serving, it's, it's plugging into a faithful church that will not compromise off of God's Word, and that will not uh, ultimately um, go the way of the culture, but will stand not necessarily against it like that's the goal, but where it needs to be um, even mischaracterized sure. as you are just against, 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 right? You're anti, you're phobic, you're all these things. Um, you got to take those lumps on the chin, realizing that ultimately that's the call, because just, just as they hated Jesus, so they were going to hate us. Mm. Yeah, that's the movement for sure. From conversionism, that kind of transformation, then bleeding out into our lives such that we defend and declare what the Bible says is true. And um, with a strong apologetic and a strong gospel and a bold light to the world, uh, we contend yeah. for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. So let's wrap it up in the final few minutes. Just what is our pastoral call to the church? What's our heart for people to, particular Christians, uh, to understand in this Equality Act? Uh, I'll, I'll go first here. Um, we want to demonstrate um, just the incredibly deceptive use of language with calling it the Equality Act, which truly amounts to grave inequality. It is, it is unequal to naturally born women. It is unequal to children, children in the womb, children out of the womb. It's young girls and women, not only in sports, but in vulnerable situations, and particularly, again, the least of these, the adoption centers that are going to have to close down because they're not going to bend to this rule. And then the, the fallout and the harm to kids, for example, it is incredibly deceptive to call it an Equality Act. And it is, make no mistake, it is an intentionally um, 
chosen word. How could you be against equality, sure. Scott? Shame on you. Isn't it great? Our government wants to make sure no one is discriminated against. That's another word intentionally used, yet impossible to define in this paradigm is discrimination. Anything that shows resistance to the revolution of pick a letter, anything that shows a resistance to it and that contradicts it is going to be inherently um, in discrimination. And you talk about the cancel culture, it's going to be totally necessary to try to wipe that person or that church or that business out because they uh, discriminated. And again, just a broad brushstroke word. Yeah, I, I just I want us to make sure that this is just one example of where it's a sure. battle for the dictionary. Right. Christians need to be mindful of almost any conversation they're going to get into with the competing worldview, ideology, philosophy, religion, you are going to be battling over definitions of certain words, even cults using similar words mm, to Christians, right. but meaning something very different. I think one of the most helpful things to do is say, uh, when you use that word, what do you mean by that? Like, it's hard to even enter into some of these conversations, first of all, because they're very emotional. But second of all, trying to get a definition, as you already said, Chris, uh, we tried to find a definition of equality and struggled significantly to find one. Well, how that act is defining it. How, how that act yeah. is defining it. And so, but again, it gets back to, especially in an argument, being able to take the time and patiently ask the person to define their terms and then take those definitions and line them up with what is biblical equality actually? Is there something, is there such a thing? And what should that look like? And how does that compare to the revealed word of God? But yeah. the battle for the dictionary is real. And then, um, you know, moving on to this, uh, we want you to understand, Christian, what really is going on. And, and Scott, you were talking about something that I know we've both listened to. Um, yeah, Vody Bauckham had a yeah. sermon called Gay is the New Black, and uh, he... I think it was called Gay is Not the New Black. Okay, gay is not the new black. <laughs> I, th I think that's what but it was. But certainly that was the that was the idea. Is he was there's pushing this... against... Uh, actually, it wasn't gay is the new black. Oh, yep. okay. So, um, well done. But... The point to you, you're Gaze saying is black. that it's in fact not. So that being said, he he did address three ways that the culture is trying to bring this in to normalize it in front of us. And so let's just make sure as we're being exposed to different cultural influences, we know what's happening. He mentioned desensitizing, jamming, and conversion. And okay. I just want to touch on those really quickly, just so we're mindful of those, okay? So desensitizing is meant to get things like the LGBT kind of agenda in front of the culture in very normal, attractive forms, right? Make them the best character, the funniest character in a TV show. Just make them seem normal and keep pressing that this is standard, this is normal, there's nothing to, to see here kind of thing. This is very much just let it pass on through. Jamming is about equating the idea of, you know, being transgender or homosexual with the idea of being like, or that you're, if you're against those things, LGBTQ, whatever it is, you're going to be compared. Jamming is like saying, oh my goodness, that's like, you're like basically equivalent to a Nazi right now, the way that you're handling right. that, your moral stance, you're, or like a member of the KKK kind of idea. Mm. And then conversion is this idea that there is a movement you know, behind these uh, LGBTQ agendas where there is, they're trying to get people to advance their cause. In a sense, it has the feel of its own religion. And, and we've seen mm. that play out in a lot of different ways, but conversion is trying to get them into advancing that cause. And meanwhile, if we're not... They're trying to take ground in the process, and if we're kind of shoved, like we said, Christ, you know, and, and um, put on, put Christ on the shelf, put our Christianity on the shelf, they're going to continue to take ground. So those three words that you just went over, um, desensitizing, jamming, and conversion, critical for a Christian to understand that there is a play being run on us right now. And that's not to say that's a new reality. That goes back for a long, long time. The goals and the actually, you know, it wasn't widely circulated, but the clear writing of academia about these very things, in order to change cultural opinion on fill in the blank, we've got to run these plays. And part of the point of propaganda, which so much 
of this is propaganda, is to uh, shame and embarrass you and to not even necessarily promote the truth, but to just run right over detractors, right? The threatening, intimidation, silencing, and canceling, and then and then while you're all doing the desensitizing, jamming, and, and the conversion process mm-hmm. is a great illuminating, uh, great in a terrible sense, but it's illuminating in terms of how Christians can understand, man, what's happening in all of this? These are some of the plays being run on all of the culture and definitely being run on the Christian church as well. How else would we want people to respond, Scott? Well, I think one of the things we're having to come face to face with, like I said this to you recently, is like, Chris, I think I'm going to end up going to jail at some time and at some point in my lifetime. Sure. Like, it just seems like it's moving so fast. And and maybe that sounds a little bit fatalistic or, hey, you know, that's, uh, come on, man, you're over, you're over or, exaggerating or some yeah, of that stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's starting to prepare in some sense, having right. those conversations in the church, like, are you really to stand for these things? If it means going to jail, if it means significant fines, what is the church going to do? This season with even COVID in general, has started to present that. I, I had a pastor that I went to seminary with who got arrested in Canada for continuing to preach and not shutting down his church. Right. So James Coates, who's kind of been a little bit all over the place, people are trying to stir up prayer for him. Uh, his wife is outside the jail that his hu- her husband is in talking about what's going on and asking for prayer and those kind of things. So just, I think, familiarizing right. ourselves with how different our, our our day is and and getting ready for uh, persecution unlike we have seen in America, really. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and then finally this, this is not lastly because it's last place, but really it's really the place to start and persevere in his prayer. Yeah. Um, pr- prayer of all kinds. Truly prayer this would not pass. Prayer that God would move in the hearts of, of people even that do not honor him and do not call Christ Lord, but God sways the hearts of kings and rulers and to sway them not to go the nuclear route. Sure. And, and prayer for Republicans to stand up for truth and prayer that he would get a hold of a few Democrats mm-hmm. who would, because uh, they're awfully unified right now, but that, that some would break rank to uh, even shockingly um, divert this effort and have this fail. But should it pass, also the prayer of pr- preparedness, the prayer for boldness and for courage, and yes, humility and compassion for the lost, but the prayer that the Lord would uh, glorify his name in this, even if it is taking what you just said. Um, I mean, again, that's not a joke. We don't say that lightly, the idea of you like literally going to jail because you just preach the next set of verses in whatever book we're in and you get into the topic and um, not seeking it, but faithful to whatever God's Word is revealed, doing the whole counsel of God, preaching and teaching it, recognizing that this could be um, not only pastors, that could be business owners, um, that could be em- 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 employees, that could be eventually fathers uh, who are who are um, you know called out by ch- children and, and, and teachers and administrators, and uh, there is not an exemption really to be found. There's really nowhere to be to, to hide right now for Christians who will stand faithfully. And so prayer, uh, in every sense of that word, the Lord would move and the Lord prepare his church for these days ahead. It's a great end to this podcast because it's really a great beginning on how to respond after listening to this podcast. We would encourage you even now just to pray and ask the Lord to intervene in some significant ways for the good of uh, society uh, and the glory of his name. Um, in fact, um, we've never prayed to end a podcast, Scott, but I think we should do that. That's awesome. Why don't you um, lead us, man, and yes, we'll sir. just close with these words coming to the Lord and just listen to um, this prayer wherever you are and, and, and pray, uh, pray along with us here. Well, Father, it is a tremendous privilege that we get to pray, and because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we are uh, welcomed to come confidently into the throne room of grace to seek that which we need, that mercy and grace we are after in our time of need. And Father, this is a great time of need, and there are great things at stake as have been presented in this conversation. There's so much more to be said, but God, we pray for your mercy to rain down uh, on 
on, on this decision and how it goes. We pray for, though, we know that the, the confessing and forsaking of sin is what brings that mercy down. And so I pray for just a change of heart, Lord. Uh, I believe it's Proverbs 21 that says so clearly that you direct the heart like a stream of water of the king. And so I'm praying, God, for that sovereign intervention to, to withhold this direction, Lord. I pray for righteousness to be upheld in those who are um, entrusted with leadership over us, uh, knowing that even in this situation, Romans 13 is still true. Those who are over us have been instituted by you, God. And so I pray that the judgment that seems like could be coming would be withheld and repentance would instead pour out leading to mercy um, and that we would just um, give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for that, Lord. And if it does pass, Lord, would you prepare your people to suffer well uh, for the sake of your name? Uh, would you prepare us like the apostles who not only suffered, but rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer for the gospel? Let us not hold back. Today is the day to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Would you raise up godly people and godly men as pastors and preachers to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to proclaim a biblical ethic, Lord, that is tied into implications of how the gospel truly transforms the whole of the person. And God, we pray that you would take all of us were at some point Christians, we're all some point um, non-Christians, dead in our trespasses and sins. I pray that you do the same radical work you've done in Pastor Chris's life and my own and many others and the lives of others that some may never think would even be possible that they could get saved. God, magnify your grace, show off how awesome you are by rescuing and ransoming more and more people from their sin, from themselves and delivering them out of the kingdom of darkness and transferring them into the kingdom of your beloved Son. And we pray this in the great name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Doxa Logic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit doxachurch.net.